Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Good evening to everybody who's logging in. God bless you. It's uh, wonderful to be able to go live with you tonight. I have a word that is uh, powerful. This God has been speaking some stuff to me that has been so powerful. And I'm, I'm happy to share it tonight. Um, I'm going to try to go a little bit slower than I have been. Uh, my problem is I get on here with you guys and I just feel like I want to unload everything God's showing me. But uh, tonight I'm going to try to slow down and give you more of an incremental uh, word. Maybe I'll go again in the next few days and do it in parts. But <clears throat> I want to speak tonight about the body. Good evening, Miguel and Luann. I see you guys. God bless you. I want to speak to you about the body tonight, the physical body of man. And I want to talk about the redemptive purpose of God in the physical body. And in other words, what God's plan is for the human body. And I'm, I'm speaking specifically to the born again Christian. Julie, God bless you, Tracy. Hi. So uh, I, I would encourage you tonight to get a piece of paper out and a pencil, a pen. I'm going to write, I'm going to give you some scriptures that. Um, will help you when we're done because I'm maybe going to uh, open up some things that you've never thought of before. So I want you to be able to go back to the scriptures and study them out and see um, and maybe let this minister to you. I've, I've been examining myself, searching myself uh, in a way I never have before uh, th in this area because I can see now uh, something I could never see before. I've hinted, hey, Diane, Joe, God bless you guys. I've hinted around this idea before in, in sermons and teachings that I've done, but I've never really got the full impact of, of this idea until probably today as I was seeking God. And uh, so let's, let's start off by, uh, I wanna ask this question. And this is a question that I pose to myself and I am posing to myself. Uh, and I think it's important that we, we ask ourselves this question. And, and that question is, does the Holy Spirit have unhindered access to my body and all that I possess, my physical body and all that I possess, does the Holy Spirit have unhindered access to, the, to those things, no matter what, that he can move, that he can demonstrate, manifest himself through my physical body? Hey, God, God bless you, Miguel, Lily. So I, I began to question that in my own life. Does the Holy Spirit have unhindered access to all that I am and all that I possess. Is there any part of me where the Holy Spirit is unable to pop, to, to, to come through? Um, we've been talking about the Spirit-filled life. And really what we're talking about is the highest quality of spirituality. And, you know, people think spirituality is, is knowledge. We know enough things that are spiritual or we might know more than somebody else. And, and so we think that's spirituality. But let me tell you something. You can have a fat head full of knowledge and be totally unspiritual. You can, you, can, you can know all kinds of stuff. Uh, matter of fact, Paul said you can speak with the tongues of men and tongues of angels. And if you don't have love, you have nothing. You have no spirituality. You have nothing real. Uh, what God wants to do in this, in this day is raise up people that have the very same, listen closely, the very same power that Jesus Christ walked in, that he manifested to the world. The, that God wants to raise up people who have the very same power that Jesus Christ had, that he demonstrated. Now we know in Acts 10.38, it says that God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Jesus Christ was anointed by the Holy Ghost and power from God for the sole purpose of helping, healing, delivering, saving those that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. So Jesus' ministry was not a preaching only ministry. It was a preaching and teaching ministry. Then that might have been even his primary ministry, but that wasn't his only ministry. Jesus Christ's ministry was in healing, saving, delivering, and preaching. And we know that, uh, I, wanna, I wanna lay this down. I had somebody reach out to me and tell me I, I, I was getting off track and maybe I was focused too much on the supernatural. Let me tell you guys something. I don't apologize. I'm more focused on the supernatural and the, and the Holy Spirit than I've ever been in my entire ministry. And I am solely convinced, surely and 100% undoubtedly convinced that it's the word of God, the will of God that we begin to get this because the church for too long has depended on knowledge, has depended on being able to argue information and that hasn't worked yet. 
Jesus Christ's ministry was not a contentious ministry. He didn't try to go in Bible box or fight people uh, scripture for scripture. That, that's a lot of what Christians are involved with today. Maybe I know more than the next guy or whatever. Let me tell you, Jesus' ministry, hey, Alden, God bless you. Jesus' ministry was not a ministry of contention and strife and envy and jealousy, and I know more than you. That, that's worldly ministry. The ministry of Jesus Christ was a demonstration of the Spirit of God and power. And, and what God is trying to do right now is raise up Christians, believers, who are so completely and totally yielded to him that he can flow right through their bodies unhindered by the Holy Ghost. And so the body is this, is this peculiar vehicle, and I, I begin to see it as a vehicle, the body. It's a vehicle that carries your spirit and your soul. But it's also the vehicle that God, think about this, the vehicle that God has chosen to demonstrate himself through. In other words, if God doesn't have a body that is surrendered, that is yielded, that is clean, that is holy, that is, that is un, un, uh, unfocused on all the other stuff and totally focused on God, if God doesn't have that body, then God can't demonstrate himself to the world like he wants to. Because, and this what blows my mind, is that God has linked himself to the human body. And in, in a sense, if the human body and the Christian doesn't get to the place where they're supposed to to be useful from God, it hinders God from being able to be demonstrated and manifested to the world. So the Christian's responsibility to have their bodies given over to God is so tremendous. And the effects of that surrender or lack thereof is so su significant that if the Christian isn't in the right place, it doesn't just affect him or his family. It affects multitudes of people that would otherwise be able to, uh, through that person, trying to bring people into a place of usefulness, that they would be in a place where they would be able to have an unhindered, unrestricted flow of the Spirit through their physical body. Now, if you don't think that's what the gospel's all about, get back to your Bible and read it again. Jesus said in, in Matthew, or Mark, I'm sorry, chapter 16, in verse, verses 15 and on, and even if you read the whole chapter, he told them to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, for most, many of us, we've stopped right there and thought, okay, now I'm going to go preach the gospel. That's my, wait a second. Before you go doing the first thing, read the rest of the chapter. Because he said, he that believes your preaching and is baptized shall be saved. And he that believeth not shall be damned. And he said, these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall, they shall, they shall, they shall. Speak with new tongues. They shall lay hands on the sick, and the sick shall recover. They shall cast out demons. They shall drink poison, and it won't hurt them. Nothing by sh shall by any means hurt you. Jesus is sending them out, not just as preachers, but preachers with a demonstration of the Spirit. Now, Jesus came in Luke 4. We know he went in the temple and he said, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he's anointed me to, and he goes through the list, to preach, to heal, and to deliver. So Jesus' ministry is preaching, teaching, healing, delivering, setting captives free. That same ministry is what he's given us to go out and perform. Not a lesser ministry, not a ministry that we can manage in the flesh, just teaching, preaching, and communicating, and then arguing the gospel with people. That is so not what God called us to. He called us to demonstrate, not to argue with people, not to try to be, be, be more knowledgeable than people, but to actually demonstrate the Spirit. The problem is, and I've, I've heard you know, throughout the years, and I probably even fell into this somehow. For those of us that believe the power of God is for today, we are to see the same signs as Jesus said in John 14. He said, the works I do, you shall do also, and greater works than these will you do because I go to my Father, and I'll send you the comfort of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus promised us the greater works, the same works he did, healing, casting out demons, and all the other. And, and for those of us that believe that that's for today, we have to somehow wrestle with this idea. Why aren't we seeing it like we ought to? If it's for today, if it's God's will, why aren't we seeing it? I'm going to give you the answer. It may not be what you like, and it wasn't today when I was thinking on this. It, it was I was getting stung. You know what that means? You feel the sting of God in you. 
and and you know I, I've said to well that maybe it, it's for the end times move of God or maybe uh, the Holy Spirit has withdrawn from the church for some mysterious reason maybe because of abortion maybe because the church has gotten into apostasy we've made all kinds of excuses why the Holy Ghost isn't moving with power today except the one reason we've missed is the true reason it's because the church has gotten worldly and the saints of God have gotten into unbelief as a result of worldliness. And I'll show you that in the scripture here today. Um, if not today, in the next two times that we meet, I'm going to show you in the scripture our, our issue. Our issue is that we've gotten so consumed by the world. so my, Our minds are so busy, so exercised by the world that our, our hearts are full of unbelief. Our hearts are full of doubt. Our hearts are full of, of all kinds of issues, like, like the, the Word of God says in Mark 4, that the Word of God is sown, but then the, the, the seed is sown and, and, and the thorns grow over the Word and choke out the Word so that it can't bear the fruit. Well, what is the fruit of the Word? Power. The Word of God produces the power of God. But when the Word of God gets choked out by busyness, the cares of life, the love of other things, it doesn't produce the fruit. So the lack of the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the power of Jesus Christ not coming through the saint, the real problem is the seed is getting choked out. Now the seed will do its job every time. The seed of God has within it all that's needed to perform God's will. But we have a part in the, to play in whether that seed produces the fruit or it doesn't produce the fruit. We can water the seed, cultivate the seed, we can grow the seed, or we can squelch the seed. Well, the church has been busy squelching the seed of God, quenching the Spirit of God, and not, not being in a quality of Christianity where the Spirit can come through. So the lack of of seeing the manifestations of the Spirit is not the Spirit's fault. It's not God's problem. It's not a lack of His will. It's not a lack of timing. It's not because He's waiting on some great move of the Spirit in the end times. It's simply because there aren't enough people yielded bodily. Not just, see, we think of yielding to God in our spirit, but there's not enough people yielded bodily to the Spirit of God. Meaning, it, do I see my body as a uh, an instrument just for me to go out and satisfy my desires? Is that what my body's for, to carry me to go exact my own pleasures? Or is my body the vehicle by which the Holy Spirit of God can have unhindered and unrestricted flow to manifest himself to a dying world? Now we've got to answer that question. Now I would have said, if you asked me on the spot, do you see your body as the vehicle of the Spirit or is it your own, your own vehicle to do your own will? Well, I would have said really quickly, oh, it's the Spirit. But today, I, upon examining myself and, and really meditating on this for hours, I, I began to question, in what way do I see my body as my own property to do my own will? And, and I think about how I'm going to do and what I'm going to do and how I'm going to do it, and I go out and do it. Little thought goes into this vehicle. This body is not my body. This body belongs to somebody. Somebody purchased my body. And by my, my, my taking salvation, I accepted the, the, the price. Somebody offered me the blood of Jesus, Christ's life for my body, and I accepted the price, and I gave my body to the Lord Jesus Christ at, at the cross. If you've been born again, that's exactly what you did. Now, in the, the scripture to, to prove that is in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. He said, what? Know ye not that your body, not your spirit, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit that, that is of God. And you, he said, are not your own. You don't own your own body. You don't own rights to yourself. When you became born again, when I became converted, I took my body and I said, Jesus Christ, I take your, your life, your sacrifice, your blood, and I give you an exchange, my body, my, my will, my heart, my desire, whatever it is in my life that I had that was mine is now yours. I've given you ownership. In 1 Corinthians 6.20, he says, know, know you not that you are not your own and you were bought with a price? Glorify God, therefore, in your body and in your spirit, which are the Lord's. You do not own your life. I don't own my life. Now, to the degree that we realize this and, and yield in faith, not just yield from stop sinning. I think so, so many, for so many years, I've been preaching surrender on a very elementary level. Surrender to me meant... Stop sinning. Quit your sin. And for me, that was big news because I was a good sinner. I was a horrible man. Of, I was a horrible man. I was a horrible human being. And I was so entrenched in darkness. Just to come out of darkness and into light was a humongous breakthrough for me. And I praise God for it. And I would never make light of that. That is a, a tremendous thing to come out of sin. But you know what? In the big scheme of things, coming out of sin, that's kid stuff. 
That's elementary principle stuff. You, you want to know where that says it? says it in Hebrews 6. Let us leave the principles of the doctrine of Christ, not laying again the foundation uh, of these gospel, doctrines like repentance from dead works and of judgment and of, of faith. Those are principles. Those are elementary things. Unfortunately, we got to keep laying those elementary things because it seems like it takes us a long time to get it. But they're elementary things. Stop sinning. That's elementary. There's another level of, of yielding to God that isn't necessarily stopping sin. It's letting your heart, your inner life be so in, entwined with the Spirit of God, so in tune with God's heart, so yielded in, in faith, not just stop sinning, but faith that says, God, I believe that it's your desire to own me, to possess me, to, to, to have access to my life so that you can come through, so that I'm a conduit and not just a container of the Spirit. The Spirit of God's not just in there blocked off so that he can't come through, but that he's in and able to come through my being because I'm so yielded and I believe him. I trust him. I have, I have such a confidence in his willingness to come through and to touch people's life through my body. Now, this is an inward knowing, an inward yielding. It's an inward faith. It's a, it's a confidence in God that I see my body not as mine, but as his. And that if I'm not in a place where I should be spiritually, that he can't come through. And that robs people of seeing Christ in me, the hope of glory. Now, we've talked in the past about living in the spirit. And one of the terms used for the ministry that we Christians are engaged or should be engaged in is called, Paul refers to it as the ministration of the Spirit. Think about that. You are administrating, administering, ministering the Spirit of the living God through you. And that's how Paul saw his ministry. He says, seeing we have this ministry, we do not faint, but we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty because we have this ministry. What is this ministry? It's the ministry of the Spirit. In other words, like a doctor administers medicine, the man of God, the woman of God administers the Spirit to the sick, just like a doctor would administer medicine. To Paul, that's how he saw his ministry. He was releasing something. You could see that in his language when he says, I wish I was with you right now, that I could lay my hands and impart unto you some spiritual gift. Paul knew that the spirit of God that was in him was wanting to get through him and impart into the believers, into the people that he ministered to, something of the life of God, something of, of the spiritual nature of God through his physical body. So he knew, Paul said, I am a minister and that we have received this ministry in the spirit. That's what God wants. But look, it comes down to your physical body. Make no mistake about it. We sometimes over-spiritualize Christianity and we miss the, the, maybe the, the, the natural side of things. That God wants your body. He wants your eyes. He wants your, your ears, your hands, your every aspect of your physical nature. Because God wants to come through the physical nature. I think that's what makes the angels uh, shake their head. That God created man out of the dust and then breathed his life into that human being and that man became a living a living being and that God said I even through the fall when man got down in the trenches of sin God said I have a plan that's going to not just renew their spirit but it's going to renew their body so that their body will be the container the conduit through which the spirit of God can dwell and then move think about this for a second I'm going to let, let me read this scripture to you I know y'all know it what? Know ye not? This is 1 Corinthians 6, 19. What? Know ye not that your body, your body, not your spirit, your body is the temple of the, the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God and you are not your own. Now think about the temple because in, in Bible times when this was written, they understood temple. We, I don't think we have a clue about temple, but if you don't know a lot about temple, the good thing is you can go back in the Old Testament and read. I, I don't, I'm not necessarily recommending this, but it would be helpful for you eventually to get back there and just read in Leviticus and some of the Exodus and some of the, the Old Testament uh, commandments and ordinances of how the, the, te the temple was supposed to operate. Do you realize that the temple of God in the Old Testament was a holy place? I mean, so sacred was it? They weren't going to be doing the ministry of God in the temple one day and then watching the Super Bowl the next week in the, in the temple. Let me assure you, the temple was 100% dedicated to the service of God. Not, not on Sunday or Wednesday or whatever day you go to church, but every day that, that temple, the temple of God, was the place where God ministered. Now, what does that mean if we now are the temple? The church, the Christians are now the temple of the Spirit of God. That is, we are the, the, the temple is the building through which God does his ministering. 
You can't turn that on and then turn that off and then go to service and turn it back on. I think part of our problem is we've seen the, the power of the Holy Spirit or the gifts of the Holy Spirit as something that just enhances our church services. Like we want God to come in and do some spectacular thing, maybe to, to give validity to what we're doing or make us feel like we're on the right track. So we sometimes hype up something or say, I, I, I've been in meetings and, you know, it was... It was like maybe a little bic lighter of, of the flame of God might have touched down. And, and, and then you hear the people that were at that same meeting a week later, two weeks later, talking about the meeting. Oh, it was so amazing. God came down. And, and I'm like, you're lying. I'm thinking to myself, you're totally lying. I was there. That's not what happened. Why do we feel the need to try to hype up or pump up or make something bigger out of what's going on? It's nothing happened. Maybe a little bit of God's presence was there and thank God for that. But that's not all God wants to do. We try to pump up and hype up and elevate services to a degree. And we want God to just come and fill the service and do some amazing thing so we can go talk about how great it was. That's, that's death. If we don't get this at home, let me assure you, whatever you do in a service is fake. It's, it's just your, your attempt to try to portray something spiritual that never happened. And we resort to that kind of thing because we haven't really even seen true spiritual outpourings. But God is willing and God is able and God is looking to move by power in the, in the church right now and in your life. But if we don't get this at home in our personal life, any attempt to come to a service and pump it up and make it look like something more than it is, is nothing less than witchcraft. Trying to get into the supernatural without the Spirit of God, without really possessing the nature and the presence of God in your house to try to get to a service and pump up the supernatural will lead you into big trouble. God doesn't want us pumping stuff up. God doesn't want us trying to make something look better than it is. God wants us to be possessors of the very life of the spirit in our temple but you can't turn this on and off I, amen D diane says 24 7 and that's what i'm talking about the body must be yielded to god 24 and 7 what does the scripture say of the body we need to look closely there's a lot of scriptures i have a bunch written down that i i don't know if i'll cover them all but but if you think about the body being the conduit through which the spirit of god flows you look at the body differently I think it was William Booth, who's the founder of the Salvation Army, who said uh, a lot of Christians have a version of Christianity that's going to do a whole lot for them after they die and do very little for them while they're here on earth. I think that that's sunk in because it's so true. We have this idea of some spiritual reality we will walk into when we die. Our spirit will be alive to God. Finally, we'll be out of this body. And yet, by thinking that way, we miss out on this reality, that God wants our physical body so yielded to him now that he can manifest what's in heaven, the power of God, the fullness of the spirit through these mortal bodies here on this earth before we die. And by looking at it all in the context of what is in the life to come, we miss out on the greatest blessing and benefit that God wants to release now, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, the body, this is a, the, the actual verse I wanted to give you today. I didn't even get there yet, but it's, it's in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 13. Uh, I've, I've read over this scripture, and I missed, I missed it. I didn't get the full impact of it until maybe today, and I don't even think I've gotten the full impact, just a partial, and it was enough to send me into the ceiling. Now, he said this, the body is not for fornication. The body, your physical body, is not for fornication, not for sexual sin. Now, with that, let me say, God does ordain sex in the marriage, so I don't want, I don't want to miss, be misinterpreted. Uh, the, the Bible specifically even says in 1 Corinthians 7, the next chapter, what, know you wife, do you not know that your body's not your own, but your body belongs to your husband? And he says to the husband, husband, you don't own your own body. Your body belongs to your wife. So in marriage, God gives this, this, this commandment, that the wife would give due benevolence to her husband, the husband due benevolence to the wife, that we would buy with our bodies aid each other in sexually and every other emotional way. That's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with using your body in the marriage bed sexually. God ordained that. That's a good thing. In fact, if you withhold from your spouse, that's pure evil. That's what that is. And, and you'll be judged accordingly. You are commanded to give to your spouse due benevolence. Now, but the body is not for fornication. It's not to be used in just any slapshot way. This body, when we see it as sacred and holy unto God, 
We, we don't just get to use it for our own benefit. We, by love, serve one another. I serve my wife. My wife serves me in love with our physical bodies. That's a way that we glorify God in the body. But in fornication, sexual uncleanness, that sin is worse than any because Paul said he that sins forn in fornication sins against his own body. And that's, that's worse than sinning outside the body. You're sinning against your own body which is the temple of the Spirit of God, that the Spirit of God wants to take up residency. Now, if you've committed sexual sin, you can be cleaned up in five minutes. Confess your fault. Confess your sin to God and let the blood of Jesus cleanse your temple. Let it be clean. But now once God cleanses that temple, the next part of that verse says, and the, bo and the, the, the body's not for fornication, but for the Lord. Your body is for the Lord. And he said, and the Lord is for your body. Oh, the, the impact of that, it, it, it makes my head shake. God is, is for my body. The Lord God of heaven and earth, the spirit of God, all knowing, all powerful, all consuming is for my body. He wants to dwell there. I, I mean, that is so mind boggling. I know that it might seem elementary, but when you get the full impact and you question, why aren't we seeing the power of God today? Why don't we see the works he promised? Why if he wants to heal, isn't he doing it in the church? Look no further than right here. He looks for a vessel. Now, I want to give you this, this verse. Remember, remember that verse, though. Go over it about 10 times and let it sink in. The Lord is for the body, and the body is for the Lord. Now he goes, now I'm going to give you a verse in 2 Timothy 2.21. And again, I know you know it, but listen to it in this context. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor. Oh, I love that a vessel, your body's a vessel. If you purge yourself from these, these sinful, carnal, worldly things, then your body will be a vessel of honor. Look at next word, it says, sanctified and meet or acceptable. Meet, the word in the King James means acceptable for the master's use. Wow, I love that. I could camp out right there and just meditate on that for all day. If you purge your body of sinful things, then your body will be a vessel, a vehicle of, of sanctification and acceptable to the master's use. Just think about the master. Who's the master? Jesus Christ. What did the master do while he was on earth? He healed, he preached, he saved, he delivered, he cast out demons, he healed and helped and delivered and set the captives free. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he saved and healed and delivered then, he wants to save and heal and cast out demons and deliver now. The only reason he's not doing it through our physical bodies is because we haven't allowed the Spirit of God to sanctify our vessel so that the Master, Jesus Christ, can come down and find residency, a pure, a clean vessel that has no initiative apart from God's initiative, no will, no selfish ambition, has one mode, one identity, one focus, it's to please and do the will of God. When the master King Jesus finds a vessel sanctified like that, then it's meet or acceptable or ready for the master's use. I can't believe the master, Jesus Christ, the one that, that walked on water, the one that opened blind eyes, the one that raised the dead, wants to be in my vehicle. And he wants it clean and pure so it's fit for his use. The master wants to use you. You know, I prayed for years. Chris, God bless you. Marty, I, I, I love y'all. God bless you. I, I prayed for years. God, use me. God, use me. God, use me. I don't know how many times I've prayed that prayer. More than I can count. And then recently, I got checked in my spirit, just a check like that. And, and something like this went through my mind. I'd like to say God spoke it to me, but I'm very cautious about saying that. Could have been my own mind, could have been God. As soon as you're usable, I'll use you. As soon as you get into a usable state, I'll... Stop saying, God, use me, God, use me, God, use me, God, use me. Listen, do you think you want to be used by God more than God wants to use you? What a joke. Do you think you want people saved more than God wants them saved? If you want somebody saved, God wants them saved a thousand times more. If you want somebody healed, God wants them healed a thousand times more. He died for it. If you want somebody delivered from demonic stronghold, God wants them delivered a thousand times or a million times more than you do. The only reason God isn't doing the very work of the master through your life and my life is because the vessel isn't ready quite yet. We might have gotten close and we might be really close to being acceptable and ready for the master's use. 
But the master is looking for vessels, vehicles, bodies, bodies that he can touch down in and manifest his very life through. Do you need healing? Do you need a touch? Do you know somebody that, do you want God to use you in the area of healing? What for? Is it for, do you want a healing in your physical body to make your body stronger to go on vacation? Do you want your body stronger so that you can make more money at your job? Or do you want your body stronger that you can more effectively perpetrate the very will and, and idea of God in the earth? I think a lot of us would get healed and be used in the area of healing if our intention for those things was to glorify God in our bodies which are the Lord's. So if you're asking God for a healing and it hasn't come, you're believing God for healing, it hasn't come, check the motive. Uh, I'll give you this scripture and then you go wrestle with it a little bit. It's 3 John. You never heard anybody quote out of 3 John. 3 John, only one chapter, verse two. I wish above all things that you might prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Now, some have taken uh, the prosperity gospel way too far. I know that. And I'm not a prosperity teacher. But I do believe that God will prosper you physically, financially, and every other way. And in health, that he'll give you divine health. There's one thing. Divine healing is important. Somebody needs a healing, you get them healed. There's another thing called divine health. That is that you walk in divine union with the spirit of God and the blood of Jesus Christ is actively cleansing you and healing you continually. And the apostle said this, the great apostle John, I wish above all things, that's a, that's a mouthful, above all things, that thou mightest prosper and be in health, even as your soul, listen to that last part, even as your soul prospers. We want physical or financial prosperity without spiritual prosperity. The two have to go together if it's of God. If it's of Jesus Christ, he doesn't want your body stronger so you can go run and do your own pleasures. He wants your body strong. He wants to prosper you financially that you can go do his will. That's the problem with the prosperity gospel. It's just money for you to enjoy yourself. It's health so you can go out and do, do what you want to do. That's false. The true healing of God, the true prosperity of God is for the purpose of you and I performing his will to the fullness of our potential in him, that he can be glorified in our bodies. Now listen to this. Hey, Michael, God bless you. Listen to James chapter four. Uh, let, let's read the whole chapter. I, I'm making a mess of this thing because I am all over, but I can't help. But I want to just dabble a little bit in all of these awesome passages and talk to you about the, the, the willingness. This is the key. The willingness and the readiness of God to manifest himself to you, to manifest himself through, you know, God is not holding back his spirit. If you want God to move, he wants to move even more. How do we know? Jesus said, God is more anxious, more willing, more desirous to give his spirit to them that ask them. We are to give our children bread. And I know I have children. My children will not go hungry under my roof. And if I want to give my children bread that bad, that I don't want them to starve or go without, how much more does God want to give his Holy Spirit? We say, well, if he wants to, why doesn't he just pour it all over us? God is looking for sanctified vessels, Meat for the master's use. That, that is to say, sanctified, set apart unto God, set apart unto his purpose, set apart unto his will, yielded, clean. There's all, there, all of us have things in our life that God wants to deal with in our body. Just get quiet for a day. Spend a day in fasting and qu quiet and ask God, help me to see what's wrong with me. I dare you. You'll see very quickly there are things that are hindering God's ability to flow into your body. Would, would you be willing to do that and say, God, use me. God, clean me. God, what is there left in me that you're not pleased with that's hindering the spirit of God? And he would be all too happy to show us where there's a restriction or where there's a hindrance or a wall where the spirit can't come through. Because listen, the spirit of God wants to use you and I, but he won't cross the, 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 the line, the, the, the boundaries that he set forth in the scripture. He, he makes us come into a process of sanctification where we un, unseat and, and throw down and repent and cleanse our, our vessels, our bodies of anything impure, of anything that restricts his flow so that he can then see a heart, a home that he can abide in and move through and touch lives and do the very work that he did on earth. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The work he did then he wants to do now. He's only looking for a place to touch down. No chapter in the Bible maybe communicates that as good as this one we're about to study. James chapter 4. Now listen, where do these wars and fightings 
come from among you. Notice how he starts this chapter, and I think this is critical. When we don't get in the spirit, when we aren't focused on being living in the higher spiritual life, which is demonstrating the nature, the character, and the power of Christ through our physical body. When we're not focused on that, you know what we get focused on? Wars, fightings. You turn on each other. Christians uh, arguing and fighting or, or, or backbiting or envious of one another. You know, you always turn to the flesh if you don't walk in the spirit. I want you to study. I was going to go through this chapter, but there's no way I'll get to it tonight. Study chapter J, uh, Galatians chapter 5. Verses 16 and 17. Walk in the spirit, he said, and you will not fulfill the lust of your flesh. For the spirit is warring, he said, against the flesh. And these, he said, are contrary to one another so that you cannot do the things you would. So he said, the spirit and your flesh are contrary, fighting against one another. Therefore, you cannot do the things that you would. You can't walk in the, in the higher life. You can't demonstrate the spirit of Christ because your flesh is hindering. It's restricting the flow of the spirit. You know, so many people have issues, drug addictions, uh, pornography addictions, sexual sins of all kinds, uh, any kind of vice, any kind of, you know what those things are? They're flesh. And, you know, we try to fight to get free. You know, some people think, I need to go get deliverance prayed over me. I need to have a demon cast out of me. I need to, you know what you need to do? Maybe all those things, but you know what else you need to do? Walk in the spirit. He said, if you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of your flesh. I believe drug addiction can be broken. I don't care if it's heroin, crack, or both. It can be delivered instantaneously if we will yield our bodies to the spirit of God in sincerity. Not to just God set me free so I can go do better in life, but God set me free so I can be used by you, so I can be with you where you are. I want my body to be your body. And if a person would determine to walk in the spirit, they would not fulfill the lust of their flesh. That addiction to pornography would be broken in the name of Jesus. That anger, that temper would be broken in the name of Jesus. The problem isn't the temper. The problem isn't the drugs. The problem is the flesh. It's the same problem that's always been there. And so if you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill. So so instead of focusing on the sin and becoming so sin conscious, focus on the spirit and become spirit conscious. Become Christ conscious. Be aware of the fullness of Christ, what he did on the cross, that he defeated principalities and powers and made a show of them, openly triumphing over them in it, the cross, the, the, the best event that ever took place on this earth. If we were more aware and conscious of that, that Christ came to die to, so that I could live and be free I tell you, that's walking in the spirit. That's focusing on Jesus. Then the, the, the sin has no power. It's lost its hold on you forever and ever because the spirit of God where he is, there is liberty. That's freedom from sin. The reason sin has such a stronghold on us is because we're not walking in the spirit. That's another subject for another day. I'll get there, God willing. Now look at James. Where do these wars come? What is all these fightings? What is all these arguments among you? Look, look what he says. Where do they come from? Even of your lusts, your flesh, that war in your members. You know what your members, it's your body parts. You, you can get that in Romans chapter six. He said, do not yield your members as members of unrighteousness, but yield your members as instruments of righteousness alive unto God. If God had his way, our physical members would be yielded alive to God and that he could demonstrate through. So where are all these fightings and warrings and compromises coming from? They're from the fleshly lust that's warring in our body because we haven't yielded ourselves in the way that we ought to to God so that he can have unhindered access. Therefore, we turn to fighting and warring. Listen to what he said, verse two, you lust and you cannot and you don't have. You kill, you desire to have and cannot obtain it. You want it, but you can't get it. You fight, you war, you have not because you ask not. It's that simple. Yeah, but the asking isn't just some random asking. The asking is the supreme cry of the being in faith saying, God, use me, make me usable. Bring me into the fullness that you have for me. Set my life free. Use me in your kingdom. God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. That supreme cry that comes out of the deeps of man. Oh boy, that's, the, that's that which apprehends the promises of God. That shallow cry where we're one foot in the world and one foot in the church. It won't be heard because we're asking amiss, he says. Verse three, you ask and receive not. In other words, you've prayed for the things of God and haven't gotten them. Why? You've asked to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. You haven't gotten it. And instead of questioning why I didn't get it, people say, oh, it must not be for me. Maybe God didn't want to do it. We always put the blame on God like he's unwilling to do what he promised to do. No, the problem is with you and me. We ask amiss. Why? We ask God, use me. Give me your spirit. Well, what do you want the spirit for? 
God, give me this, give me that. What do you want it for? Is it for the glorification of Jesus Christ? Is it for the ministry of him? Is it for his purpose, his will to be established? Or is it for you? That's a solid question. Do you want healing for you or do you want healing to be useful for God? Oh, that's a big question. Listen, that you can consume it on your lusts. You want something from God so you can go use it for you. God doesn't answer those kinds of prayers. Now look what he says next. You adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that a friendship with, of this world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of this world is the enemy of God. He's speaking to Christians. He's saying, you want what you want from God. You're using God for you and you're not receiving it, and you're not questioning why you're not receiving it. You're blaming God or blaming your who, who knows what. Your church didn't have the power. The guy that prayed for you, oh, he must not have had it because I didn't get it, and if he had it, I would have got it. No, you didn't get it because you asked a mist that you could consume it on your lust. It's a heart check. If we don't get what we're praying for, maybe we need to question why. Is my motive wrong? Am I, am I, is my heart right? Because as soon as we get our heart right in faith and ask God according to his word, he heareth us, it says, and we shall have whatsoever we desire. Read Mark 11, 23 and 24. Whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe you receive them and you shall have them. That's a promise as clear as any promise in the scripture. So unanswered prayer should be an indication to us something's not right. And that something isn't God, and it's not God's word, and it's not God's timing. It's us. It's our hearts that may not be right. So listen what he says. Do you not know that if you want to be a friend of this world, you're the enemy of God? You can't be a friend of the world and have what I'm talking about. You can't be a friend of the world and get your prayers answered. You can't be a friend of the world and walk in the fullness of Christ. You can't be a friend of the world and, and have your vessel sanctified and ready for the master's use. The master can't use you if you're in friendship with the world. If you're in bed with the world, forget it. You're unusable. But listen what he says. This is amazing. Just pay attention. I'm going to close here just shortly. Do you think, this is a question, do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy. The spirit that dwelleth in our, our body, assuming you're born again, you have the spirit in some capacity. You're born of the spirit. His, your spirit is born by the spirit. Do you think that the scripture says in vain that the spirit that's in you lusteth to envy? Now, that word lust is usually negative and envy is usually, that's two negative words used to describe the spirit within us, lusting and envying after us. What does the word lust mean? It's a passionate desire, usually for something evil. In this case, it's the passionate desire, the envy even it can be described as, of the spirit over you, desiring to be in you, working through you to have access, unhindered access and flow through your physical body. Can you just picture that for a minute, that the Spirit of God is burning with yearning, with desire and passion of the most ultimate kind to come through your physical body to demonstrate himself to a dying and needy world. We've never had a world that needs a demonstration of the Spirit of God more than this day, more than now. And the Spirit of God is not stingy. He's not holding back. He's not keeping himself from you. It's not time. Brandon, God bless you. It's the fact that we haven't yielded to him our physical bodies so that he can have a flow, a place, a temple that's so dedicated to him, so that's after his purpose so that he can come through. Listen what he said. But he gives more grace. Wherefore he said, God resists the proud but gives his grace to the humble. Humble yourselves. Submit yourselves, he said, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. What a statement. Stacy, God bless you. What a statement. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. He wants to use you. He wants to work through you. He wants to fill you. He wants to have unhindered access in your body. He wants to be the master Jesus wants to come through you. Submit yourself, therefore, in light of that reality that God's not stingy. God's not holding back. God's not waiting on a time that's right. He's waiting on us to say, yes, God, I'll give you all of my life, all of my body, all that I possess. It's in your hands to use as you desire. When that happens, the Spirit of God says, this is what I'm at. Now, don't expect to say that prayer one time and see all the manifestations of God. But when our heart begins to track in this direction that we see what God really wants is a body that's yielded, a body that's surrendered, a 
body that has faith in his promise, a body that's reaching out, a heart that's reaching out and grabbing onto God with all of its being, saying, God, if you don't go with me, don't move me from this place. I don't want to go through the motions. I don't want to just walk in, the, in this life anymore with head knowledge, passing on information. I want the full capacity and impetus of the Spirit of God through the person of Jesus in my mortal flesh. And until I'm ready, God, keep killing it. Keep, keep bringing me down. Don't bring me up. Don't let me out of the pocket, God. Continued to bring me down into this death until all this left is the life of Jesus Christ in my mortal flesh. Submit yourself. Now look at this, look at this promise. Draw nigh unto God. He gets gentle here. You can tell in the first part of this, he's like, you sinners, you guys need to repent. This friendship with the world is enmity with God. Don't you know the spirit of God is yearning with jealousy? Submit yourself. Then he changes his tone and says, draw nigh unto God. Don't go out and try to fix yourself. Don't let, don't let condemnation and guilt and shame come, come down on you like a weight. If you think I'm preaching this to guilt anybody, Please believe me, I'm not. I want your heart to be so hungry for the will, the purpose, the friendship of God Almighty that you would draw near, that you would not live outside of his presence Monday, Tuesday, then get in his presence Wednesday and live outside his presence Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and then get in his presence on Sunday. That empty Christianity, that, that, that you'd be delivered from this and draw nigh unto God, that your body would be as godly, as submitted, as yielded on Tuesday as it is on Sunday. Sunday and every day for that matter that you wouldn't be just following a Sabbath idea of God one day a week is God's and six is mine but that you'd follow a new covenant idea that all seven's yours God and every day and every hour of every day is yours God and and bring me into a, a communion a fellowship with the spirit of God so that I have it in my house so that when I come to a meeting where there's a healing needed a touch needed a word needed I'd be instant in season and out of season always ready to give the word of the Lord or heal or deliver or minister in any capacity where I'm needed because the Spirit of God never took a time out and I don't have to have music to conjure up some emotional feeling or, or, or charisma, but that I would be ministering. I could walk out of the car and walk into the place and be as full of the Spirit there as I am in my bedroom. And I don't need music and I don't need hype and I don't need anybody to pump up the crowd. I'm simply living out of that place, that fellowship, that sweetness of God's Spirit. This is what he's calling us to draw nigh unto God. And he will, he shall, he will draw nigh unto you. There's no greater promise in all the scripture that if my heart burns for God and I draw into his presence, he's right there to say, I've been waiting on you to come. I've been waiting to use you. I've been waiting to sanctify you. I have so much to speak. God has so much to speak to each one of us. He's not short of words. If things are quiet, it's just because you haven't been in a place where you can tune into the frequency of God's spirit and hear. It, it takes quietness. It takes serenity. It takes, ah, uh, be still and know that I am God. If we would but do that, we'd hear words that would shake our entire existence. Draw nigh unto me, God said, and I will draw nigh unto you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your heart, you double-minded. Come out of this double-mindedness. Come out of my body's mind on Monday and God's on Sunday. If your body's not God's every day, then what do you have? It's not Christianity. It's something other. God is drawing us back into himself. Can I give you a few scriptures? I think I gave you enough. Romans 6 points out this, this idea of the body very clearly. Let not sin reign therefore in your mortal body. Don't use your members as instruments of unrighteousness. First, first Timothy 4.8. He said, for bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having a promise of the life that is now and that which is to come. Bodily exercise is nothing wrong with it. He said it's good, a little. It profits a little. You know, some people get so pumped up in their body and they're so proud of their body and they're so vain of their body, it's become an idol. But it's not that he's saying that you can't have exercise or you can't, you know, you, your body should be strong. But he said that just profits you a little bit. But godliness is profitable in this life for your body, but also in that which is to come, that we would live in a godly condition. Jude 1.9, and I'm gonna close right here. I think I told you I'm gonna close, but let me give you this other one just so I don't forget. First Thessalonians 5.23, ooh, baby, what a good one. He said that the very God of peace might sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit, soul, and 
man body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus. So the body is, is equally important as the spirit, as long as you're on this earth, because the body is the carrier of your spirit, your soul, and the Holy Spirit, and it's the conduit through which the spirit of God flows. Now think about Jude 1, 9 in closing. Isn't it amazing that, that, that Moses' body was contended over by Satan and the archangel Michael? That Michael contended over Satan uh, about the body of Moses? What would Satan want with a dead body? Think of, I was thinking about this today. I never pondered this really deeply. I thought, why would the, the devil have an interest in the body of Moses for? I mean, this is a dead body. He's dead. He's gone. The spirit of Moses went on to be with God. But his body's there, and, and the devil wants it. And the, Michael, the archangel, comes to stay, say, oh, wait, wait, this body isn't yours. And they, they had an argument, a disagreement, a contention over the body of Moses. And it says, Michael didn't dare bring an accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you and went his way. But it made me think, why would, God, why would Satan want this body? You know, that body was an offense to Satan because it was through that body Chris, God bless you, brother. Kelly, hello. It was through that body that God came down into a man and the glory of the Lord was shining upon Moses. And when Moses was doing what Moses did, it was bigger than just what was being transacted in the natural. There was spiritual realities being transacted. In, the, in other words, every word of Moses carried with it something more than just a man's voice. It was, the, it was the voice of God and the glory of God. And to Satan, he brought Satan's kingdom tumbling down through that same body of Moses, a man's physical body. So when that body finally died to the ground... Satan was so angry and irritated and upset at that body that had done all that damage to all of his purposes and all of his plans that he wanted to get his hands and wring that body out. You see that again in Revelation chapter 11. The two witnesses come down on earth for three and a half years. They're given a ministry, whether that's Enoch, whether that's whoever, Elijah, whoever. These two witnesses have a three and a half year ministry. I know most Christians don't know this is in the Bible, but they're given three and a half years on earth. And during their ministry, it doesn't rain for those three and a half years. And they have the ability to speak and fire comes out of their mouth and consumes whoever resists them. Think about that. And by the time they finally get the upper hand on these two witnesses and kill them, they take their bodies and riddle them through the streets and put them on display and send each other presents and gifts to celebrate a day where they brought these two bodies down. And then the spirit of life came from God and entered back into those two bodies and they were resurrected. Whew. The body, the body is so important. The devil wants your body. Can't you see? The enemy wants to take your body and use it for his purpose. God wants you to, to take your body and use it for his purpose. So the battle over souls is, is as much a battle over bodies. The enemy wants your body. God wants your body because it's through your body that the work of God gets to be done. So if you don't see the sanctity, the, the holy awe and wonder, I am fearfully and wonderfully made that God wants to demonstrate and possess your body. If you don't see the value of your body, Look at yourself differently. If you need healing in your body, let it be because you want to use your body to glorify God. Let that be your mode. If you want to be used in healing, let it be so that you can bring deliverance to people's bodies so that they can be strong to go out and do the will of God. It's not just for ministry functions. It's for the sole purpose of giving all the glory that Christ is due because by his stripes ye were healed. God bless you guys. Love you.